It's my pleasure to be joined today by Brian Schultz, who is running for state Senate over in District 33, Idaho Falls. So without any further ado, Brian, thanks for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to lod and chin with questions, if you want me to do a little bit of an intro, uh, what works for you? Well, actually, what I've been doing is, you know, asking candidates how they got here. You know, what's your life story? What's your uh, journey to the point where you're standing for public office? So, uh, say in a, a long-term view, I've always been conservative and concerned about things, uh, maybe the general directions of things. I've helped people uh, to to run campaigns, help people get elected, uh, Congress people, um, uh, both won and lost. Uh, I helped with Brian Bilbray in Southern California on a campaign as campaign manager. I uh, worked for Brian, um, not Brian, I'm Brian, uh, BJ Lawson. He was kind of a Ron Paul candidate out in North Carolina. Uh, so I've done this a little bit. Um, how I got here in this specific instance is I was living in uh, Europe most of the last, oh, probably 15 years, uh, 12, 15 years. I've spent a lot of time in Europe. Uh, that's where I met my wife. We had our first two kids there. Um, we came back to the United States when Trump was in office. Um, you know, things were good. And with that, uh, I, I'm from Northern California. We landed in Northern California, spent a little bit of time there, but uh, the writing was on the wall. This was pre-COVID. The writing was already really on the wall about 15 years ago. Um, you know, and as beautiful it is, as it is, it was just, it, it didn't seem like a great place to raise a family and, and that things were getting uh, worse, not better. Uh, we drove around. Uh, Idaho was always interesting, but you know when we looked at some of the other West Coast states, they 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 also were um, facing the same problems of California. They were just about five or ten years behind. We found Idaho Falls, uh, fell in love with it, and uh, and moved here essentially. And that was about five years ago. Since then, we've had two kids uh, also here, so we have four little ones, and. Um, now we're here, you know, and one of the first things that struck me, uh, uh, having this idea of going to Idaho and thinking, oh, this is a ruby, ruby red state, you know, this is a really conservative fashion. I think that's true somewhat in, in North Idaho, but East Idaho is not necessarily that conservative. There's a lot of kind of squishy rhinos in office. And the electorate here, uh, you know, I think they appreciate how good it is, uh, just just like I and my wife do. We we came here and it's it's fantastic. But there's one thing that's maybe different for me than people who grew up here, and is that that I have this uh, this uh, gut reaction that this reminds me of the, the 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 beautiful Northern California of my youth, and I also see the same signs of things starting to to go wrong. So. Uh, that that generated a, a particular interest in trying to find candidates to um, uh, to support and to help and to get in the process. COVID was a nightmare. I was I was uh, really glad to be in Idaho and not somewhere else because it was much better here than other places. But um, you know, when I went to look around uh, for for let's say people to support, I found there wasn't a whole lot of people to support. All my legislators were. Uh, uh, um, mediocre, uh, no, not that great, good. I don't know. We have one that's okay. Um, but uh, we have two that are horrible. And uh, no one was stepping up to bat. So people asked me to run against uh, my senator, and uh, I did. And and that time we had a, we have, uh, we have Marco Erickson and we have Dave Lent. Dave Lent is our senator. Uh, I think um, uh, I was just endorsed by uh, Stop Idaho Rhinos, and they said something to the effect of Dave Lent is like the Julie Yamamoto of the Senate. He's uh, They both have education backgrounds. They're both terrible. I'm paraphrasing, uh, you know, but it's 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 the, the direction is right. So, uh, and then we have this, uh, we used to have Brian Zollinger, very conservative, but he was replaced by Marco Erickson, who's terrible. It seems like he... They, you know, I, I, I'm running against one, but I'm running against both. I'm, you know, in some ways, maybe I'm running against all the senators in East Idaho that just seems to be uh, uh, big business rhinos. They're all pro-ag. They're all pro. Now I'm pro-ag, but I'm not necessarily pro-big business. 
they're pro big pharma, they're pro big business, they're pro school board, they're pro union. You know, um, union's an interesting one because uh, uh, I've done a lot of uh, construction work, different different kind of union like jobs over the years, and the the truth is, like most union members are going to vote for Trump. But oftentimes the union leadership is very disconnected from their base. And I feel like the leadership here in East Idaho is very disconnected from their base. People are essentially uh, conservative, but uh, they maybe are busy or they don't they don't sense the danger, but they they keep electing these guys that that don't really um, represent their interests, I think. They you know, some of my senator is famous for returning calls and listening to people. Or they think he's listening to them, but really he's listening, if it comes down to it, to, to Ayaki, to the dairy farmers, the dairy lobby, you know, the people hiring illegal immigrants, the people who want a uh, driver's license for illegal immigrants. Yeah, so there I am. So I'm in the race, and then uh, uh, I had, a, I think, a, 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 a good showing, but I didn't win. Um, and... Two years later, no one's running. No one, no one, no, no, no one, uh, no one has seemed to be stepping up. So in this case, I'm running again, and it turns out my treasure from the from last time is is running against Marco Erickson, Jaleen Berger. She's a fantastic uh, um, conservative. She'll be a great rep. Uh, the the fact that two of us are running means there's a little bit more synergy to the race. Uh, you know, while we're running our own campaigns and where we're uh, where uh, we're certainly uh, friends and I think we're both strong conservatives, we're running our own races, but there's got to be some some clear uh, uh, complementary aspects to our races, uh, not just of who we're running against, because the people we're running against were both censured. Marco Erickson was censured by his party, as was Dave Lent, and that was for not uh, Following the the um, the Republican Party platform, but it's also about following the the Constitution and the the basic the the it, what what makes a Republican. It, it either means something or it doesn't. And in this case, uh, you know, we it's a clown show. We're trying to upset the uh, the clown show. I feel so, like there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, uh, so where to start? I, I guess my first question is, uh, you know, as you said, you ran two years ago, and it was, uh, you know, you did okay, but it was pretty lopsided. Uh, the incumbent won oh. with about two out of every three votes. So, so what so, makes this year different? So, so one thing that's different is there's a big push in Idaho to overset the entire Republican Party. There's races for PCOs at every level. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite surprising, you know, when I when I talk to all the conservative PCOs about walking literature and things, they all they're all walking. Um, there's there's I think most years a lot of PCOs don't get out and really bang on doors and this year they are. So that's one thing. Now, that 33 percent is kind of tricky because that 33 percent is the I, I would say the hardcore conservative base. Mm -hmm. So I got that. I actually did better than only slightly, but I did slightly better than in within my district than Janice McGeehan or Brian Smith. But our our votes mirrored each other. So the thing is, well, what about this district? In this district, we have three representatives. One is actually quite decent. Uh, she's she's a, a Citizens Alliance pledge signer, Barbara Ehart. She's got reasonable grades, Bs. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if she's in the Cs on anything, but she's got a. You know, I, I used to I used to give her uh, I used to be a little bit more dismissive of her uh, voting record because I, I can be a purist, and after I've been looking at things so much, I think like you know Barbara here it's pretty good for East Idaho. I'll take her. You know, I'm I think I'm pretty happy to uh, throw my weight behind her again. You know, she's not a Brian Lenny. She's not a Scott Herndon. Uh, she's not a Heather Scott as far as voting record, but it's just not that it's not that bad either. Um, so that's one thing we have. Uh, the Marco Erickson seat was held by someone who had a conservative voting record. We had uh, my seat 
uh, Dave Lent seat was held by someone who had a conservative voting record, Tony Potts. Um, there is that room there. And then has this uh, district changed? Well, um, you know, a lot of people have been moving here. And I'd say the people that move to East Idaho uh, tend to be left coast political refugees like myself. They're not they're not uh, screaming liberals. They, if the screaming liberals go to Idaho, they seem to go to Boise. They don't go to East Idaho. So there's been a population shift. Um, so where do you get those 17 percent? I've worked on a lot of campaigns, so I'm not naive about the numbers. I think when you talk normally about 33 percent, you go, oh, well, that's tough. But I know in my district, we have one conservative legislator who keeps getting elected. We also have uh, at Lincoln Day, I was um, uh, shared uh, uh, the table uh, with, among other people, uh, our county prosecutor. He's a good stalwart conservative. He ran three times. The first two times he got 33%. And then the uh, the third time he had a surprise victory and, and people, uh, they voted for him. They, they, they were worried about the uptick in crime. They were, you know, and he's, that's more his, is specifically his area. But um, so, so there does seem to be some kind of thing that can go on. Um, there's more synergy with this race now that there's two people running against the two uh, the two um, kind of left-leaning Republicans or Republicans in name only. You know, do I think it's a shoe in No. Uh, am I happy to be out there talking about issues that they wouldn't be talking about if I wasn't in the race? You bet I am. Uh, do I think uh, there's a, a possibility that um, two years of Biden economics might have rubbed some people raw? Maybe. Uh, is Are people concerned about the border? I would say in East Idaho, they're not yet as concerned about the border as I wish they would be. Uh, but it's hard to judge because people tend to be politically correct and they don't bitch about things in public here as much as they maybe do in North Idaho or or uh, other parts of Idaho where we have more conservative elected representatives. Everyone sees the, the footage. Everyone knows, everyone hears these figures, 10 million, 12 million, 30 million. I mean, we don't know how many illegals are in the country. Well, you, you mentioned uh, you know, so, some of the you know, changes that have been happening in your district. And you know, looking at the map over here, your district is essentially just the city of Idaho Falls. Uh, so it's, it's different than a lot of other Eastern Idaho districts that are very expansive and geographically large. Um, what are some of the unique challenges of your district? How do people see things there? And what are you learning when you're talking to people and knocking on doors? Uh, so there's twofold. I mean, I think it, 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 in a sense, what people are feeling and thinking, I think mirrors other districts in the sense that people are hurting are hurting. So people who are worried about the grocery bills are, are very, very worried about their grocery bills. There's just more of them. There is a mitigating factor here with the lab. The lab is a big employer. And I do sometimes have a sense that uh, with the lab, people are so cushioned. It's like it's government, not government, but it, you know, it's such a, a solid employer that people you know, except for their price, you know, the groceries going up, they're not worried or they're not stressed out about it. Uh, and I, I sensed that two years ago when I ran. Um, so it, it's it's hard to it's hard to judge. I feel like there's a, a huge swath of people that are very concerned about endless wars, open borders, out of control inflation. And then there's these hyper educated people you know and, and the question is just how much are they the the people who see what's going on with uh trump and biden seeing this this law affair knowing that this could be eventually turned on them and that those figures are growing uh the question is how fast are they growing we want them to grow faster we want people to be more aware but for the people who just go home and turn on fox news or NBC and and you know try and watch some news and catch up on the world before they put their kids to bed. They they uh, they may be living in a little bit of a fantasy world still. And I I can't totally judge what those what those splits are. Well, you mentioned some of the issues that you're seeing are endless wars, open borders, inflation, you know, the weaponization of government. Uh, what can you do as a legislator representing District 33 to you know, 
to address that? So looking at my opponent's records, you know, some of the obvious ones uh, are the finances. He vote, It doesn't seem like there's a spending bill he won't vote for. But I also get the impression that people aren't really willing to uh, uh, crawl through grass, uh, glass on, on, on spending bills. It's, it, you know, it's, it's something where everyone kind of gets it. It's important, but it doesn't quite have that uh, emotional take as seeing um, this lawfare that's out of control or these these borders that are open. So, you know, well, uh, I will be uh, essentially a voice of the taxpayer. While I will be conservative as far as spending issues go, very conservative, I think, you know, generally I, I'd probably get uh, uh, pretty high ratings, I think, with all these different scorecards. The things about, you know, uh, borders becomes a really important issue because normally people just default and say, oh, well, that's the feds that should take care of that. But the thing is, the feds aren't taking care of it. And this idea that we're just going to um, wait till Trump gets elected and everything will be fine is is uh, there's a lot of there's a lot that can go wrong with that scenario. Uh, hopefully he gets elected and he's able to do a great deal. But once these people are here, it's going to be there, no one has a stomach for just deporting everyone. I mean, I, I hope they do. I, I wish they would. But the best thing is to keep the millions upon millions of people who have crossed into this country illegally from coming to Idaho. So we can sit there and we can uh, get involved with cross-border packs. We can uh, go after illegals uh, like other states are doing and essentially arresting illegals, people who have... Uh, it, it, it's a felony to enter the country illegally. Now there might de be some disagreements with the feds about this, but we have to we have to think outside the box. We have to consider uh, a nullification in some aspects. Is uh, we have to stand up to the to the feds as as was designed by the Constitution. You you one don't make it friendly for people to move here who who don't uh, have the right to to live in the United States, but you also go after people uh, who are here and you maybe go after their employers and you maybe go after the people who bust them in. I know the dairy farmers don't want to hear that, but you know, when the dairy farmers say, oh, we need 70% illegals to do our business, they what they do is they say, we, we can't hire locals because locals don't want to do the work. But the thing is, there's always a wage aspect to that. And there's another aspect to this, that when uh, dairy farmers or big ag get these hordes of illegals to do the work, you, yes, they 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 uh, they uh, they'll they'll do it at a lesser price, but essentially society bears the cost. We bear it with higher crime. We bear it with high schools going uh, south and our schools getting. I mean, you end up with a polarized society of like an underclass and an overclass, very different than uh, what I would want or what was here when I originally arrived. It's changing fast. I see it. Um, you know, you can walk in a fast food restaurant where everyone in the uh, restaurant is essentially uh, uh, an Anglo, and everyone behind the counter is a Latino. And though, so you sit there and you go, you see the contrast. And it's not like that in all businesses. But once the business defaults to that position, we're just going to go for the cheapest labor we can get, maybe a franchise or something. It's very hard to shift this this paradigm because they'll always say, "Oh, well, no one else wants to do the work, and and uh, and and they want too much money." So that that you know that I'm I'm going on about illegal immigration, but I think it's an emotional topic, and uh, uh, I think people care about it. Endless wars. We can certainly pass the uh, uh, the defend the the guard act of not just sending our national guard overseas without a declaration of war. Um. The aspect of, uh, you know, this wokeism, we have to, what should simply be in place, our right to free speech seems to be under assault. So we might need to codify, codify uh, aspects of our right to free speech to be able to say, you know, it, th this whole aspect of, 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 of how we have to interact with liberals or, uh, or self-proclaimed transvestites I mean, it's all it's all meant to create a situation. So in California, in in Washington, it seems it's the case uh, that they they've created these situations where everyone is a criminal because you you're walking on eggshells. Anything you say can be used against you, and then they prosecute selectively. 
And, uh, you know, I think people can laugh and say that won't happen here. It seems to be happening in lots of places, Canada, Scotland. I mean, there was lots of news articles going out that J.K. Rawlings, the, the author of um, um, oh, uh, Harry Potter, Harry Potter, uh, you know, would go to jail in Scotland because she said, you know, uh, uh, there's two genders, uh, you know, and that's suddenly illegal. And you think, oh, well, that's so ridiculous. That wouldn't happen here. But, it, you know, it happened so fast. Even Boise is probably uh, getting a little bit tricky. You know, what, what can you say in Boise without getting accused of being uh, racist, homophobic, uh, uh, against this or that. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of people who who, who uh, will say, you know, I believe in free speech, but, you know, it's always this free speech, but argument. And uh, so it's tricky. You know, we, we need to, the constitution isn't perfect, uh, but it, it does, uh, it, you know, a lot of times I feel like the constitution is, is is not being followed but then when i look at other countries they say okay well it seems like it's really wounded but it's not as bad as other places where the first and second amendment seem to be completely gone so when it comes to that issue on uh you know freedom of speech uh against you know things like forced pronouns and you know stuff like that they, they did pass a, a law this year that would protect government employees, you know, school employees and such from being forced to use alternative pronouns. Uh, you know, what more do you think that the government can do to protect free speech? Uh, and, and by that, I mean the state legislature. What, what, what can we do in Idaho? You know what? We might be, uh, uh, in, in, things might be getting uh, a little bit weird as far as, so what, what, what will the state legislator, uh, legislature in Idaho have to do to protect its citizens so, for example, there's this rule in Idaho now, and what happens when an in Idaho and goes over into Washington and gets arrested for uh, misusing pronouns? How are we gonna How are we gonna navigate that? I mean, it might be that uh, we're having to deal with some kind of law affair of our own. It seems that Democratic strongholds all over the nation are going after Trump. You know, maybe we have to be in a situation where we're just gonna simply have to. Uh, fight them with their same, you know, manner of uh, of overstepping in lawfare. I mean, it's nice to say, okay, well, our citizens are protected. Who goes sometimes to Washington or Oregon or Nevada? I mean, uh, who who goes abroad to France or Scotland or, or Canada? It, it, you know, at a certain point, we have to not just uh, we have to protect our own people, but also maybe push back against the oversteps of, of, of what we're faced with around us. We don't know where things are going. You know, everyone hopes Trump's going to get elected and it'll all be okay. You know, I, I said that before. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice scenario that one, he'll get elected, and two, that everything will be okay. But it seems like there's a lot, there's a lot going on for one man to roll back. A lot of this has to... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just I was going to shift gears to a... Uh... You know, to a more, I guess, mundane topic, uh, bring, bring it down to earth here. Uh, you're the incumbent is obviously the chairman of the education committee in the Senate. Uh, he also sits on the finance committee, which is part of JFAC, which sets the budgets. Uh, where do you see your talents being used? Uh, when you're there in December, you're picking committees, obviously you wouldn't necessarily get your first choice, but if you could, what are, which committees do you think would, um, would you be best served in being a part of? Well, you know, in in some ways, as far as committees, where uh, I, I think it depends a little on the makeup of the legislature. But for mm -hmm. uh, funny enough, education would be fine. The thing is, I have a very per different perspective on education. I don't necessarily think it's an aspect of throwing more money at the problem. I don't think the 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 problem with our 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 uh, government schools is that we have to to put more money to them. I think what we need is more freedom. We need more, um, uh, we need money to follow students and parents. We need more, uh, we need to codify as much as possible that people have a right to homeschool without interference. Uh, we need, uh, I think uh, I heard it uh, the other day that right now Florida's, Florida is implementing something close to $8,000 per students that will follow the students or the parents that's earmarked for them, whether they homeschool or private school or public school. So 
I've worked a lot as an entrepreneur and I've helped start uh, a lot of companies working as a consultant. Uh, I'm really good at problem solving and looking at things um, from the perspective of, you know, what, what, uh, what do people need and how do you find solutions? Right now, a lot of times when I hear about education, all I hear is there's not enough money. And in what little innovation there is, it's stifled because it's government. So, uh, you know, maybe that's just an example, but uh, I think that would be fine. But, I, um, uh, you know, I feel sorry for the people on JFAC. I'd probably be good at it, but they uh, they they spend a lot of time uh, uh, bent over spreadsheets. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have to give them the... I'd, I'd be inclined to cut, 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 but I know it's not always that easy. Uh, you know, I think what's often easier is not raising, you know, the amounts that people work with or not doing unfunded mandates in the first place. Once they have these gargantuan um, bureaucracies in place, uh, yeah, it gets to be, I don't know, like dancing in front of a burning house or something. <laughs> well, coming back to education, that's obviously a, a big issue. The um... Every year, there's some big new initiative to well, invest more in education, as the governor says. Uh, this year, it was uh, school facilities uh, funding. Um, but at the same time, there's also been efforts to expand school choice. You know, Obviously, we have school choice in that uh, parents can send their children to public schools, private schools, micro schools, pod schools, home schools, et cetera, charter schools. But there's, you know, some people want money to follow the child, take the tax money and have it follow the child instead of staying in the public system. So obviously last year there was a education savings account bill. It failed in the Senate. This year there was a tax credit that failed in a House committee. What do you think would be the ideal way to handle that, if if anything? And how do you convince enough legislators to support something? So you have to work with other people, and I think you can try and figure out uh, common ground. I don't, uh, you know, many of these things, they, they just, these bills go to a drawer and they die. They get crushed because we don't have enough legislators that are conservative. So I don't want to say, oh, I'm going to reach across the aisle, blah, blah, blah. I mean, basically, they get everything and we get nothing. Every Everything we wanted died in that respect. So this idea that we're going to, you know, go there and do some... Um, horse trading, uh, there's something to that. But I mean, it, it, there is a little bit of a trick with these conservative liberty type legislators that they often aren't, they don't have a lot to give because they're just saying, let the taxpayer keep their money, uh, follow the constitution. You know, it, it's sometimes hard uh, in that respect. So you try and find common ground. I think, you know, when you're dealing with unions, everyone agrees about uh, uh, worker safety. Uh, everyone agrees about wanting to have a uh, uh, people to have a living wage. We just sometimes disagree about how we get there. So how do you how do you go through the uh, legislator and, and get some of these things done? I think I try and look to people like Scott Herndon and Brian Lenny and and uh, uh, other legislators who have been very effective as freshmen and see how they did it and, and get advice. Um, you know, I. I come with a, a pretty broad skill set that's both technical and entrepreneurial, but you know, I, I you I don't think you know until you get there quite how to how to do it. Uh, at least I'm not coming to the table without a sense of how to negotiate and how to get things done and how to problem solve. So, you know, you're coming from Eastern Idaho, Idaho Falls, and as I've been talking to people, I've been really noticing a difference in you know, how different regions see things. Um, now, obviously, you know, you're conservative, uh, but the Eastern Idaho legislators, with a few exceptions, you know, they're the ones who score kind of in the middle on the Freedom Index and uh, legislative analysis. Very um, few exceptions. And, and I think there's a, I don't know, a debate within the Republican Party about things like the role of government. You have some people who are absolute. The role of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. That's it. And they want it shrunk as small as possible. But then there are others who come out and say, well, there are certain things government can do, and it should do those things. Getting involved in, say, emergency medical systems. And you know, obviously, it's already involved in the public school system because that's a constitutional mandate. Uh, so 
I guess it's kind of a two-part question. Where do you draw the line on that? You know, what, what do you believe is the role of government? But also, since government already is intertwined in agriculture, business, you know, healthcare, how how, how do you start pulling that back uh, without just leaving everything to crash? Uh, it's a difficult question, but I think oftentimes you know you're you're pushing for the limited role of government. It's hard to negotiate the the way. It's hard to negotiate these things too much. I mean, it, you, you can you can talk with people about problem solving. I think when people are open minded, they can come to a lot of solutions. You don't necessarily have to go in and say, "Oh, you know, I will only agree to cutting the budget by eighty percent." You know, for the Idaho state government, that's kind of. Uh, but you can certainly go in and say, "We're not going to spend any more money. We have to. We have to. We have to work within." uh bounds and 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 start working towards spending less money on programs you have to uh fight new programs you have to see what programs could be um taken or get in away with but i'm 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 not naive just uh, uh i think what, what it, I, I think there's a trope for milton freeman about like the you know the the, the longest living creatures like a, a government program with a a, a shortened uh with a limited lifespan or something or something that was set up to only be for one or two years and it's there forever. Uh, yeah, for, for people who don't get that, that's really hard to, to get around. They just think like this launch program, you know, they said, well, we're going to do it for five years and then we're going to look and see what the results were. You know, after giving away a hundred million dollars, there's going to be so many special interests in place that things never going to die. But I'm happy to try and kill it. Of course, when anytime you try to kill a government program or reduce spending, you'll always find people, whether they're uh, citizens or activists, you know, lobbyists, or even fellow legislators, who can, you know, they come up with a very compelling reason why this program is definitely not one you want to cut. Uh, and, and you'll see that if you watch the legislature when they're debating budget bills. So, you know, it, anything you do try and cut, you're going to get pilloried in the media. Uh, one example that comes up. You know that I think about a lot is when Representative Redmond presented a bill to put some sideboards on the Medicaid expansion program. Hundreds of people signed up to testify against because they were worried about losing their benefits. Once people or industries become dependent on government, then they will fight tooth and nail to keep that because you know otherwise they fear that they're you know just going to fall. So how do we reduce the size and scope of government? Reduce the say the welfare and entitlements uh, without just dropping people off the cliff. How, how, how do we do that in a gradual manner? You know, I think you want to, uh, if you're talking about welfare and entitlements, I think you want to push as much as possible for people to have things like health savings accounts. But you, you do have this problem that when you have a, uh, a dependent underclass, it's very hard for them to see, even if it's the, to their benefit not to be dependent, to, to get away from that. So, I mean, it's a little bit of an education thing. It's a little bit of pushing back against the bureaucracy. But uh, I think it's very hard for people to get their head around um, giving up benefits. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, it's also a question of uh, if you can push a, a low regulation environment and you can make things attractive for businesses, Obviously, if there's more employment, people are going to be maybe more partial to uh, uh, to a different perspective. I think it's really hard if you have someone that's dependent. It, it, it's going to be hard for them to see uh, a different perspective. Uh, you know, I wish I had great answers on that. Um, I, I will say that uh, you know the the Brian Lennies and Ron Nates are thinking a lot about this. You know what. What is a way to make change palpable? What that that we can put something forward? You know, you don't always have to win big fights. Sometimes it's winning little fights. Um, so, uh, in in a sense, that from the question, I feel like you're you're preaching to the choir, and and uh, uh, I I'm sure I'd be happy to hear you know uh, su successful you know ideas. Uh, one thing that's great about America is we have this federalist system with 50 states. Now, people want to uh, change that and they want to make everything the same. But by having 50 states with 50 different directions, even the bad ones, 
you see different things that go on. And sometimes it's very small. You know, organs a mess, but they it could be that they they uh they deal with their chiropractors better than we do because they they have more of a level level playing field. So it's not like you can't learn from other states. And other states before they were bad, they were good and they had all kinds of things. I mean, Washington and California were were great centers of innovation until they weren't, you know. Now it's now they're all splitting for Texas and Florida. But uh, a lot of things that they put in place before it went south, uh, you can look at. You can look at what's going on with Florida right now. You can you can say, how are they doing it? It was just as Lewis Brandis who coined the term lab, uh, laboratories of democracy for the states, where each can try something and see how it works. Unfortunately, you know, there, I see two problems with that now. And one is that we see what's gone wrong, as you know, those who have come from California can attest to. Uh, and it seems like people just don't uh, don't listen or they don't believe that that's the problem. It's like, you know, your neighbor comes over and says, you know, the house is on fire. It's going to spread to your house. And you say, well, I don't see any flames. I don't smell any smoke. We're, we're good here. Stop, stop spreading uh, fear mongering. But then on the other hand, with our federal government being what it is, you know, it, it exerts so much micromanagement at the state level. How, how do we disentangle ourselves from that? That's uh, so. That's a good question in the sense that it's uh, it's more of this welfare state. The more people are on welfare, the more they're addicted. So you, it, it's a question of pushing against it, trying to educate people, saying that you know this always comes with uh, strings attached. You know, one aspect of it is uh, uh, contesting these elections, going out and speaking about these things, having alternative news. I mean, we're. We are a little bit uh, in a problem when when people go to Fox News and CBS and CNN for their nightly uh, fix of one half hour of news, and they don't do a little bit more deep investigative reporting. But at least, you know, Idaho Dispatch, Gem State Chronicle, The Signal, these these groups uh, have an influence, and it also has an influence to have a legislator that's up there talking about this stuff. I can bet you uh, Marco Erickson and Dave Lent, much less Kevin Cook and Harris, they're not, they're not spending a lot of time talking about how we can reduce the size of government. They're not talking a lot about uh, you know, the problems with the illegal immigration. They're talking about uh, you know, driver's license for illegals. Uh, so so it, 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 it's this constant fight for liberty. I don't know what to say. It's, uh, it's nice to have a some pat answers, having people in a position of authority that can that can attest to the problems in other places is helpful. I, I feel like sometimes there is this, you know, the, these left coast refugees, they uh, they come, they're coming from war zones and they have they have uh, perspectives that are they're based on experience. It's hard when everything's so nice, everything's so nice in East Idaho. People are just, they, it just seems like it could go on forever. Having people say, no, there's limits. There's no go zones in other cities. You know, there's places you can't go and it's changed. That's changed so fast. Um, so it's these, these little constant little fights for liberty. Well, uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Is there any other issues that we haven't covered that are near and dear to your heart that you want uh, people to know about? Probably, but I can't think of them at the moment. So we we can we can cut it there. Well, you know, go go ahead and uh, you know, give us your closing statement why uh, you should uh, be elected to the Idaho State Senate. So my name is Brian Schultz. I'm running for Idaho Senate against Dave Lent in 33. Uh, I'm interested in uh, health freedom, education freedom, uh, issues of liberty. Uh, in limited government. Uh, this is a clear contrast to to me and the person I'm running against. I mean, I think you could say it uh, that I'm very conservative and he's uh, much of a, a Romney-like figure, figure who, who believes much more in big government, government interference. Uh, um, yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up. So uh, my website is votescholtz.com and Please go check it out. Read a little bit more about what I've said and, and thought and, and about the campaign. Brian Schultz, candidate for state Senate from District 33. Thank you.
Thanks.